Today on HTO Football, we have the pleasure to be joined by the game's leading physiotherapist and rehabilitation experts, Gary Lewin and Colin Lewin. They talk about their time as head of physios at England and Arsenal, talk about the return to the game after COVID quarantine, and talk about the Lewin Clinic. Enjoy. Welcome, Gary and Colin, to HTO Football. Thank you for joining us. Uh, firstly, uh, Colin, obviously the, the Lewin Clinic was set up last year. Uh, how have things been going it's, in, it's uh, opening and currently with the lockdown easing as we speak. Yeah, well, we opened um, end of October. It was quite a long road to get it open and get everything rolling. So, yeah, that was uh, in the last year. We got to about week 20, week 21, before COVID decided, along with the government, that we had to close down. And, yeah, it wasn't ideal because things were climbing week on week and it was... It was really going well, getting a lot of different people through the door from different walks of life and really enjoying it. And then to close down from what ended up being late March has been a bit a bit difficult, but we're sitting and waiting for the green light and mm. uh, then we'll get things going again and hopefully pick up where we left off. Yeah, and I, I presume it's obviously it's a non-contact sport, so obviously returning in, in a big way. Um, so hopefully that should see a bit of footfall for you before you both. Yeah, I would think so. There's a lot of people doing too much running or running for the first time in their lives or suddenly finding they enjoy cycling. I think there's going to be a lot of people. Yeah. Which is good in many ways, isn't it? It's yeah. Well, I, I play, yeah, and I, play, I played golf over the weekend, which is about as athletic as I get. Um, but it, it was, the courses were packed. So, you know, I'm yeah. sure people will be pulling some sort of, some yeah. sort of muscle there. I think I'll you're be, right. I look, look forward to seeing them. Yeah, I think I've been. I think I've been one of those ones that's turned into the new, the new Mo Farrell <laughs> over the last few weeks. Uh, decided to have a run every day, but obviously not the same distance. But um, yeah, so obviously all the speed, all the speed, same speed, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, same speed, same speed. Well, over ten meters, same speed, <laughs> same speed that he'll maintain for ten thousand meters. Yeah. Um, but as we as we just mentioned, obviously sport is returning slightly, and, and in the last few days we've obviously had the announcement that the Premier League will be returning on, on the seventeenth of June. Um, was that a surprise for you both, or did that did that feel right? Not really. No, I think it's it's just been building up and building up, and especially with the Bundesliga starting. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion over here um, from seven a- several angles. Really, the first one is obviously from COVID nineteen. Is it safe? Mm. Um, I must admit, I'll probably say the training grounds at the moment are probably one of the safest places you could be. Um, for all, all mm-hmm. the work they've done. Mm-hmm. Um, then you've got the second point about is it morally right to be going back and playing football while people are still dying? Um, so that's been quite a debate over here. Um, and the third thing is obviously players having six to eight weeks of working out from home. Mm-hmm. Um, the debate is going on about whether there's a higher risk of injury when they do return. So, mm-hmm. yeah. You're looking at a free front, really. I've thrown into the equation the full front of the anxiety of the players. Yeah. And I think Psychological that's side of it. Yeah, yeah exactly. They, they, they've got to go into competitive sport mm. with the anxiety of mm. are they safe? Are mm. they remaining safe for their families? So, yeah. it, it's, if we, quite, it's quite a dilemma. Yeah. If we can, then, if we just quickly briefly touch on those four things. From a firstly, what kind of uh, implications or, or precautions do you think they'd be pushing on, on the training grounds um, with, with the comeback? What, if we could get a glance of what you well, think they might look like? We've read everywhere. They've gone through several phases. The first phase, um, pre-phase one, if you want to call it that, was where they just returned to what they call part running. So a lot of the players were beginning to go out running and they were having a few issues with fans and things like that. And so... They allowed the training grounds to open, but um, put in special um, protocols. No contact, in place. No, there was yeah. no contact. They came in at different times. They won the same pitches. They didn't touch any equipment. Um, so that was phase one. They then went into phase two, where, again, it became a bit more formal, where they were allowed in, in groups of four or five, but they weren't training together. They were doing individual running programs, but they were doing more ball skills. Then phase two was when they incorporate small groups and then the phase three which is beginning to happen this week when they're having close contact stroke full contact training so mm-hmm. they've gone through all the different um on procedures and protocols to keep it as safe as possible and 
Yeah. Now they're going into the final stage of how they're going to get the games on, where the games are going to be played. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've not read anywhere yet about how they're actually going to turn up for games. Are they going to shower? Are they going to meet before the mm-hmm. games? Are they going to stay overnight? Yeah, all the logistics that, of it. Yeah, yeah, all the logistics yeah. of actually playing the game. So yeah. that's the bit that's going to come out now. Yeah. Uh, but up to yeah. now, I've got to admit that they've, they've done faultlessly looked at every conceivable every angle. point and I mean the Premier League have got their own medical advisor um, Dr Gillette but the medical Premier League doctors working group there's there's vast years of experience there from Gary Driscoll at Arsenal, Paul Catterson at Newcastle, Steve McNally mm-hmm. um, at Man United, you've got Max at City I'm going to forget somebody, Carl. Um, You've forgotten them now, it's gone. Yeah, yeah so it's gone. Um, <laughs> lots of, uh, yeah, lots there's, of experience. There's lots of experience. Yeah. There. Yeah. And then at the end of the day, they're medical people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they understand what needs to be done to make the environment. It won't be completely safe. There's no 100% guarantee, mm. but it's going to be as safe as is humanly possible. And also, these, these teams aren't going to be going into playing friendly matches either, are they? You know, it's, it's, it's that straight back into action that you, you touched on a minute ago, which is the concern. Well, strangely enough, we discussed before we came yeah. on now, they've announced today they're allowed to play friendly games. Oh, right, OK. Is that that's be, Right. That's uh, been quite fresh off the press then, yeah. Yeah, from the Premier League. That okay. They don't travel more than 90 minutes. They're allowed to play organised friendly matches. Very interesting. Right. And Makes if we, sense. without putting you on the spot too much, then about that, that the second point you mentioned there about the moral piece. Obviously, we're football fans. As you imagine you are having spent your careers there. Um, you, you know, so we all miss the game. Um, is it is it a pressing issue, or is it getting over the line because of TV money and because we need to get it back, back on the TV screens as opposed to is it right to bring it back? Well, sad, you want me to? <laughs> you might have different opinions. <laughs> I think they've made it as safe as possible and I don't see any reason why it can't go ahead, to be honest. I think mm. we're always going to have that view, aren't we, as fans and as people that have worked in it for a long time. So mm. I accept there's a level of bias there, but mm. it, it can't be any safer. And mm. the, there's very few reasons I don't think, I think where you can say it shouldn't start. Mm. Um, mm. I, I think we'll look back on it in a few months' time, I hope we do and think it was the right thing to do and it was done very well. What, what do you make what do you make of the Bundesliga? I mean there's every every day I'm looking at my updates on my phone and getting this player's been ruled out with a thigh injury or a, or a, a hamstring pull. Yeah. That the, point three, I guess, yeah. Is that predictable? Care, you have to be careful of the data sources there because this all this talk around there were injuries in the first weekend in the Bundesliga wasn't actually true. Eight people left the pitch and appeared to be injured, but then I think five of them played the following week. Mm. So I'd have to check my sources on that, but it really isn't that reliable, the data. And this whole idea that the Bundesliga had a terrible injury spike in the first weekend isn't true. If you look at the data from the first Premier League weekend from the last couple of years, Mm -hmm. it isn't that different. Mm. And that's when players are supposed to be prepared and ready and been through a full pre-season. I wouldn't be too scared about a bit of an injury spike. Why is that so bad? What we shouldn't play, we shouldn't play games because a bit of an a bit of an injury spike. Uh, get on with it. Do the best you can. We've played and, uh, games in ten days at Christmas since I've been in football. Um, yeah. I mean, when I first started, I'm a dinosaur. We used to play uh, Boxing Day, it's 26th of December, 27th of December, first and second of Jan. There's spikes of injuries <laughs> then, and it doesn't mm. ever seem to have bothered people that we got spikes of injuries then. So. Mm. It is a hazard of the profession. I mean, obviously, after going so long without competitive games, there is a risk that there will be more. But mm. they've adjusted the substitution rules. Managers now have bigger squads. Um, so I think they can cope with it. And I, and I think they have to cope with it. So I, the increase of injury is not something Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of and concerned about, but I don't think it's a, a massive issue that should stop them starting the way mm. they're starting. The biggest thing to say there, I think, is... It's a level playing field. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So like you're, you're not throwing 10 teams into a competition where 10 teams have been really mm. well prepared. It's a level playing field. Now, if those first weekend of games happen to be at a slightly lower pace and they're not quite as exciting as we hope, then, again, is that a bad thing? I'm not convinced. 
and there needs to be there, for me there needs to be some sort of consideration that we you know it is a global pandemic and as you say if we if we take the decision that it's safe to come back there might have to be some misgivings which are a few more injuries or, 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 or as we know and, and rightly so um, no fans you know we can't have everything it is the situation that it is I think the only way this would be deemed not successful is if we had a spike in COVID-19 cases yes particularly around football players mm. Um, mm. but I just can't see that happening with all the protocols they've put in place to protect the players to test uh, it test every two days isn't it oh uh, yeah for everyone and, and the, the yeah. way they're, they're being educated in what's wrong and what's right mm. Yeah. Um, so I, I just can't see it happening and in the Bundesliga it hasn't there's been a few cases and there will be a few isolated cases in the Premier League as well but there mm. won't be a spike in the number yeah uh, so be careful what you read that would be the only way you could say it was the wrong thing to do mm. yeah, and I've that seen, won't know until afterwards yeah I've seen those those panoramic shots at the Colney it just looks super safe doesn't it you couldn't do any more than that I mean no, and that will go into the match day. And again, yeah. where we're looking at the Bundesliga at, at present, where they are doing the match day um, and the different protocols on a match day. Um, and the Premier League will learn from the Bundesliga what they've done. And before the Premier League starts, I think La Liga starts as well. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I, I think in general, um, it's, it's going to be seen um, to be safe. And, and, and again, the right thing to do. You're always going to get the people that argue against the morality of it's all about money. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, it's an economy. Uh, and is it going to be a good feel-good factor for Joe Public? Is it going to help football clubs? Yes. Um, and uh, to me, I just can't see any reason why we shouldn't be doing it apart from a small chance of a spike in the numbers of COVID-19. If we can, because I think it's a, it's a nice sort of segue into, into uh, sort of some comparison piece and how the, the role of, of your profession's evolved. Um, talk about the last aspect, which you said there may be some misgivings from the players themselves from a psychological perspective, and how obviously now, very much so, that's very much included in the, in the suite of a, a medical support teams um, at any given club where it perhaps wasn't many years ago. Um, but would you, what do you reckon that may look like? Would there be additional pressure for those people to play if the rest of the squad um, feel able to return? Tricky one. Um, <clears throat> without knowing for sure what's going on, it's difficult to comment exactly. But I would say that a lot of it's going to be based around education. I think the doctor's got a hell of a job trying to educate <clears throat> all the staff and the players around the risks and around how safe it is for them. Mm. And there's got to be a level of honesty there from the doctor and the people around him. But mm. I think if they're all educated, I think if they're all told exactly what's going to happen, why it's going to happen, the risk around it, what they can be doing when they're outside of the football club, which is obviously the most vital thing, I don't think it's too much of an issue. I think if you look at the number of Premier League players out there and Championship players and the ones that have you know, vocalised their objections it's a tiny mm. tiny percentage obviously they're mm. the ones that are going to get the headlines but it's yeah. a tiny percentage i don't think the apprehension now is anything like what it was perhaps in the first week or so there would have been a little bit mm. but again we're surmising really without knowing what's going on i think there will i think there will be empathy with any individual player that's got um Unique, yeah, yeah, unique um, reasons. I mean, Troy Deeney's been well documented. So, mm. um, and I think there's empathy rather than um, resentment. Um, and I think that will be accepted that, um, because yeah. of the unique environment that some players may find themselves with family and friends, mm. that there will be some empathy to the ones that don't want to involve. But I think, as Colin said, it will be a, a, a minority of the players. I think the education is key. Um, I do think, in my personal opinion, mistakes were made early where they, the players were not involved enough in the early discussions that went on. That changed dramatically once the doctors got involved and it was clear when the doctors raised lots of concerns at a medical meeting that the players need to be involved in this. I know there's been some criticism in the last two days when they've announced the EFL start date that some clubs don't feel the players have been consulted enough. Mm. And I do think there was possible a case of that to be answered early. 
But I think the Premier League realised that once they got the players on board and the backroom staff and everyone on board or on the safety issues, then um, it, it would go forward um, quite smoothly, which it has. Mm. And it's gained momentum every week. You're getting new, um, with the start date now in place, you're getting more and more information about what's happening, um, how the players are being told to work and react and to work in a, in a, in a lifestyle day to day. And look, again, it comes back to the number of positive cases. And if there were a few positive cases and players to get isolated, I used the analogy on the radio the other day that it's no different to two players having a clash of heads on a Friday. They would miss three games under the concussion protocols. Mm -hmm. A player did go down was a positive. Um, they would be isolated for seven days. If you re if you <clears throat> regard that as an injury rather than as a COVID nineteen case, people wouldn't be thinking twice about that. Would they? Mm -hmm. no. no. So I think it's the mindset towards the outcome. But the bottom line is we won't know until August the first when yeah. everything's completed, everything's signed off, and they're talking about starting next season, hmm. that's when we know how successful or were they right to do it or not. But hmm. as Colin said earlier, I can see no reasons why we shouldn't be pressing on the way we are. Hmm. I mean, one aspect of that story, diversity again a little bit, is the BME players and the number of cases. And again, hmm. that's created some anxiety. And I still don't think that's been fully explained um, in the risk involved. But yeah. I do think that players have been reassured by what the Premier League and the clubs are doing individually mm. to reduce the risk of them catching it. Um, you commented there, and, and if, we, if we could indulge in a little bit and just the evolution of, of your roles over the, over the years, um, about the support network that will be there for the players. You know, like you said, the, the doctors, the physiotherapists, the psychologist support, you know, it, it's probably the best place for them. Um, but in, you know, um, we, we do appreciate the listeners when it's been uh, privy to see this, but Colin, the, the piece you pinged over um, before we had a chat, for me, that photo is, is fantastic where you just see the, the wealth of support and infrastructure behind the management team and the players now in a, in a current, in a, in a modern squad versus potentially um, Gary, although I won't call yourself a dinosaur, like you've, you've been so self-effacing to call yourself um, when you started. Uh, there's, there's three of you in that support team, in, including George. You know, so so actually, you know, that that wealth of, of support for the players that are there. And I wondered if you could just paint a picture about how that evolved over the years. That actually, when you did start out, how many were you? Were you sharing how many jobs? How many hats did you have to wear? Yeah, I mean, myself and Colin did an article. Uh, well, that's, a while it, that's back. what you talked about. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah that's what I said. Yeah. That you're referring to. Um, and when I started in, I started Arsenal in '86. And when I went full time, I, George Graham was a manager, Theo Foley was the assistant manager, Tony Donnelly was the kit man, and I was the full time physio. That was the full time staff. Um, we had some part time doctors, part time goalkeeping coach, um, but that was the full time staff. And then over the years, gradually the staff got bigger. Um, but in those days, I, as a physio, you were a physio, social worker, kit man. Our kit man didn't drive, so I used to drive the kit van for him. Um, and you, you did the pre-match ordering for the meals. The club would book the hotels, but you'd be the liaison officer for the hotel. So when you had arrived, you'd go and sort out Stay all the room. <laughs> so our lights just gone after on a timer. Um, <laughs> So we, you'd do the room keys, you'd sort out all the food, the pre-match meal. Yeah. And, uh, basically, yeah, you, you, you did a bit of everything. Um, mm. <clears throat> going on 30 years, um, now, I mean, when you, when you left Arsenal, how many staff were there? 15, 16 staff. Yeah, there's about 15, yeah. I mean, 15. it's commonplace in the Premier League now for yeah, it is. Mm. they have two buses. Yeah. And the players and direct coaching staff will be on the first bus the indirect staff or the, the support staff would be on the second bus. Mm. That's, that's quite common now in, in most Premier League, in a lot of Premier League teams. So, mm. um, If you're honest, I think if you go back, I was 1995 when I joined, Gary was 10 years before that. We probably did the social worker, the psychologist, the kit man, the, the nutritionist, all these bits of advice. We probably did them badly. Mm. But then everyone was doing them badly. Yeah. Mm. 
So uh, mm. in 1995, when a pl I'm giving a player nutritional advice about bits and pieces, which were was reasonable advice, but nowhere near what he probably deserved. Mm. Man United, Liverpool were doing the same thing. Mm, mm, but, yeah. So it's not like yeah. any club was particularly well behind on it. It's yeah. just as it evolved, everyone climbed that ladder together. And yeah. I know we don't want to say the foreign influx mm. it in any way, but it probably did a little bit. It probably yeah. did a little bit. Every, I, every base is covered now, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and you, you could argue it's gone too far. And you, mm. some clubs are starting to skinny down the backroom staff a little bit. So mm. that curve may have just gone a bit mm. beyond the line. Yeah. But we did learn from some of the foreign players that came in. Yeah. Darth didn't have a massage therapist when I went in 1995. Mm. <clears throat> and David Platt joined the same summer mm. and said, any chance of a massage therapist? And me and Gary looked at each other and Gary spoke to the club and we managed to get someone, managed in, to get someone in a few months. And Before <clears> then, the phrase <throat> was, good players don't need it, bad players don't deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, well, I say you're getting out of the cream, doesn't it, Gary? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure that it, I'm sure his name would have come up at some point. But I guess Arsene Wenger maybe has a bit of a role to play there in that transition in '96, '97. Oh, yeah. He made significant changes, didn't he? Not, but not straight away. It was an evolution, not a revolution. Mm. Uh, but before that, to be fair, um, Bruce Freyop was a manager, and with Dennis coming in, Dave, Dennis Burkamp and David Platt coming in. Yeah. That has started to change already um, <clears throat> in with the, those players coming in and okay. how it worked. And David Platt being English, of course, but had been in Italy, obviously. Yeah, 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 sure. And mm. uh, that 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 process has started, and then it was reinforced by Arson. Although in his early days, Arson wasn't a great believer in big staff. He he really didn't like. He definitely didn't like a lot of staff travelling with the team. In his later days, and he, yeah, and mm. even when all the the support staff were put in place in the later days of his career, I, I believe that um, mm. Colin reinforces. But mm. he still didn't like a lot of people around the team because he felt mm. too many voices, too much noise. He would call it too much noise around the team. Yeah. I mean, and he showed a lot of faith in the the, the people that were there. You, exactly, know, so you see yeah. managers now bring their own sort of almost like an entourage. Yeah. And yet, when he came, obviously left Pam in situ, left you, you know yourself, you know, as, as a function. So clearly, sort of, he, wanted, he was always looking for efficiency, really. And mm. If he could be efficient, and people, minimal amount of people were doing it efficiently, why would you just get extra staff for? Yeah. The fun of it, I think. Mm. Uh, mm. Yeah, he did. He did shine a light on a few things like nutrition and stuff. It's not like he reinvented it at all, but he did shine a light on the fact that nutrition could be something that could be improved and mm. see coaches and fitness coaches mm. come into clubs more. Mm. Um, you've mentioned the massage therapist and there's a timeline on the article, but when you start moving into the 2000s, then it really started to blow up with a number of massage therapists, a third first team physiotherapist and so mm. on. Mm. I mean, there's a lot, lot, lot of players that you've worked under, especially with Arsene Wenger. There's a few, couple of players I kind of wanted to sort of get your thoughts on, really. We touched on the psychological side of the game earlier with the return of COVID and whatnot. Um, but also this, the aspect of bringing players back from injury or players that suffer from long-term injuries. Um, Abu Diaby is someone that I always think about and what he could have been, because um, what a fantastic talent. How, how was that for, for, for that the psychological side of the game for Abu? Because he was just... You know, cursed, cursed, wasn't he, really? Yeah, I think Abu sort of, sort of um, epitomises a small percentage of footballers that mm. either pick up a significant er injury early in their career that changes a lot of the biomechanics um, and then their body can't really tolerate the load that's expected of them playing in the Premier League at the highest level. Mm. Um, and you get other players that are very similar that just can't, tolerate the level that they're playing at and um, you've seen many players that have actually successful players that won't play three games a week and that's because the management know if they do they're going to overload them and get injured and mm -hmm. and, then, and and Abu who had that significant injury up at Sunderland yeah. uh, um, when he broke his ankle um, I can't I won't use the phrase never recovered from it he, he did <coughs> recover from it but biomechanically changes were made to his body that mm. caused secondary issues mm. And, and it became quite um, obvious that his body couldn't tolerate the load that was being put through it yeah. on a regular basis. Yeah, and when he was when he was out on the grass, it was like 
he was running the show at Anfield one year, I think, when we won 2-0 yeah. up there. An absolutely amazing performance. Um, so when he, when he was out on the pitch, it was, yeah, it was a phenomenal, <laughs> phenomenal talent. He was going to be the new Patrick Vieira, wasn't he? Mm-hmm. Uh, he had everything, yeah. He had everything. He just couldn't sustain it because mm. that significant, horrible mm. injury... He did well to get back from it, but yeah, there were things that we couldn't quite get back to normal because of mm. that. Uh, mm. Yeah, Abu being one, you can name three or four. Easy yeah, Jack name. Wilshire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and it, you know, yeah, Eduardo. Uh, how does that? How does that differ? Um, without going, because you'll 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 definitely lose me. <laughs> but uh, but how how does that differ from someone who who has often reoccurring injuries? If you think that even going back to sort of like a a Tony Adams hamstrings or whatever it looks like in terms of versus that one injury that biomechanically, like you just said, changes changes their ability to withstand that load moving forward versus a, a small niggle that returns, returns, returns. I can um, think of Jack Wilshire, Tom, someone like that, you know, that niggling all the time, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, uh, Jack's probably not a great example because he did suffer significant injuries to that ankle. Mm. Um, yeah. Which did change things and made it very difficult for him, but Going back to your point on the niggling injuries, I think when they're niggling injuries, Jack's patella tendon might be a good example. Um, you always fancy yourself to get over it. You always back yourself to rehab them to a certain level where they can train to a certain level and you get them back. When you've got something like an Abu or arguably an Eduardo, perhaps Tomas Rosicky hamstring at the time, you weren't ever entirely sure whether you would ever get them back you were doing your best to get them to the best they could be. Mm. Whereas those niggling ones, the recurring hamstrings, the recurring calves, you're always in the back of your mind thinking, yeah, we'll, we'll get the better of this. We will get them back to normal. Mm-hmm. I think that's probably what I would say about yeah. that. Yeah. 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 And again, it's also what is normal, getting them back to what normality, because mm-hmm. you can have a player that gets injured in a very successful championship winning team. It's out for a significant long length of time. And when they come back, it's a different team. Mm. And, and games moved on yeah again sometimes it, it, it's not only about the player it's also about the environment they're coming back into mm. um and again it's very it's 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 a bit like probably comparing players from different eras you, mm. you don't really know yeah. if they could actually get back to mm. or get into the level that they're playing at now so when they come back from injury are they back to how they were before I mean, if you read a lot of autobiographies of players like Alan Shearer, always talk about he never fully recovered from his cruciate injury. Michael Owen never fully recovered from his yeah. cruciate injury. Mm. They come back and had a very successful career. Yeah, yeah. Because they were in successful teams. Mm. But, but they knew. Yeah. But they knew themselves. They weren't quite the same. Now, the difference is at the level we're talking about now in the Premier League, it shows. If, if a player doesn't get back to that level they were at, it does more, I think. Mm. Than many many years ago, because the game is so much quicker now, and they're they're, they're athletes, they're elite athletes, and mm. uh, so any deficiency they have will show yeah. up for more. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned Alan Shearer there, Gary. I mean, obviously the the great documentary that he did on the the skill of heading and the links with dementia yeah. and things. What what do you guys think of the the the, the announcement back in I think was it February time um, with children at eleven age or under that will be sort of encouraged to not head the ball in training and. Is that, is that something you would encourage? I think it was inevitable because yeah. we don't know enough about it. Mm. And, and, and I think the rule changes are being brought in, not because we've got evidence to show that it's detrimental to the development, but more we've got evidence that we don't know. Mm. And so why would you take a risk with a young person yeah. to do something that is it instrumental to their development as a 12, 13, 14 year old heading the ball? Mm. No, it's more not. about playing football without the heading part of it. So for me, it was inevitable, and I, I think it's a good move personally. But I don't want people to think it's a move because the evidence was that it was dangerous to kids. In mm. ten years' time, it's possible I'm not saying it was. <clears throat> yeah, that's how it's communicated, moment, isn't it? Yeah. At the moment, we don't know. So why we don't know? Why we? Why would you take a risk? Communication and education around that had to be spot on. Probably wasn't, but then that's not an easy thing to do. Um, I guarantee you there were some parents stood by a pitch talking about how their child heading the ball was going to cause their dementia later in life. Remove the possibility if it's easy to do so, I think. One area I wanted to to, to get your view on, and, and 
and how much it would have impacted your roles. Is, is stability at a club from a, from a managing and a playing staff perspective? I think, you know, if you, if you go back, even when I was started watching football sort of early 90s, managers typically in their, their staff by extension got a longer run at it. You know, they, they often, you know, you see them and they come in for the contract three or four years and if they didn't work out, they, they might be moved on then. But I, I think, you know, it's, it's scary these days. It's, it's, a, it's a season and a half, isn't it? Um, you know, something like that, maybe even less than exactly, the average, yeah. average tenure. And actually, from working with the players um, and, and a manager from a physio perspective, um, what difference does that make in, 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 the, in your abilities to have impact on those players? There's two parts of that from my point of view. Um, first thing is that it, it, it makes life more difficult because when a manager comes in, the philosophy of the, of the club often changes and you have to adapt with that. Um, the second part of it, which is related to the turnover of managers, and it's a part of the game that's changed dramatically, even when I, I left club football, apart from my year at West Ham in 2008. Um, the other thing that's changed dramatically is the turnover of medical staff. Now, that's getting lost a little bit um, in discussions at the moment. Pressure's on. But, yeah, but they're talking about managers turning over. But I think if you look at the Premier League over the last two years... I don't know this for a fact, but I think either the doctor or one of the physios would have changed a, a very high percentage, 75% of Premier League clubs. And that would never happen. So even if a manager changed, yeah. what thing you, what doesn't happen is you don't get wholesale changes in playing staff. A new manager comes in and they tweak it. They might change three or four players. Mm. Yeah, but now it's a complete got, overhaul, isn't yeah. it? Now, when you bring a new medical person in, <clears throat> They've got to get used to that. Those players and those players have got to get used to the medical staff. So it never used to happen. I rem I remember when George Graham left Arsenal and when Bruce Freeup left Arsenal, the chairman phoned me at home to tell me before it went public that they were leaving, and actually said, "We need you and the other staff that have been here for a long time to be the stability or the stabilising factor when a new manager comes in." Mm -hmm. because they understood how important it was to get some st stability in the club. Unfortunately, nowadays, I, I think that's diminishing. And I think the, 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 the staff are changing and the medically are changing as quickly as the management. Now. <clears throat> Do you think that impacts the players then and then their development, potentially their recovery, which I think would be slightly speculating. But I, I know in doing a bit of research for this, some of the, just such high regard, some of the players um, think of both yourselves. Even, you know, people who are still involved with the clinic, people like Aaron Ramsey, who obviously really suffered but came back to, like we said, who knows, we would have to ask him <laughs> if he came back to his very best, but certainly came back to, to being an elite footballer. Um, do you think that such a high turnover of the medical staff would, it, would impact the players and their, their, their chances of recovery? Chances of recovery is a big word. I think you're right. That would be a bit of a speculation. But yeah. It takes you a while to get to know a group of players. If I went into a club tomorrow, I wouldn't truly know those players for at least six months, how they respond to different situations, different loads, different mechanics, different family lives and everything like that. It takes you a while to get to know them. So if your mm. turnover is enormous, yeah, it's, it's hard. It must affect how they feel about you. I think trust is a big thing as well. I think you bring a brand new physio into a club or I join a club, or Gary joins a club tomorrow. Why should those players trust us from day one? Why should they? It takes a while to build that. It takes a while to mm. get them on side. So, yeah, we were very lucky with the stability we had. You could afford to look beyond the next year. Yeah. And the year after that, and you could, and you mm. could, and you could make plans and you could... Uh, the board would... It's a luxury, you. that is, isn't it? Well, yeah, it would. And the board yeah. would trust you when you're looking to make a decent capital expenditure, you know, mm. buy something. Mm quite expensive the board would trust you because yeah they think you're going to be there in for years to come of course yeah the other fairly obvious thing to say but um yeah we were lucky with the stability we had um and that builds trust in a backroom team and i hope and i hope that, that those trust relationships still very much in, in touch with the clinic still pushing and helping you guys now yeah, I mean yeah. we've kept in contact with a lot of players who are friends. I mean they become football. I mean you would have heard the phrase football family. Yeah. Uh, when you work with people, you become part of a family, and that 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 feeling never goes. I mean, mm. um, as I said, I, I I've been away from Arsenal for for um, twelve years now, and um, but any players I see from the days that I were there, it's like long lost friends. 
and the colleagues mm. exactly the same now with the players that are there that you work with now. Mm. Um, I'm the same with a lot of England players um, that mm. I've not seen for a while, but I've been to World Cups with. Yeah. I've been loved been watching all the Euro 96 stuff because yeah, I started yeah. after oh. Euro 96. Yeah. So, yeah. I can't get enough of that Gaza goal. <laughs> yeah, but it was the same squad. So I worked with those players up to the 98 World Cup. Yeah. And uh, you, you, and I mean, I was lucky enough the other day to do a phone in on Sky with Gary Neville and Jamie Redknapp. And it was, we, I spoke with Colin about afterwards, and it wasn't an interview. It was like chat, was yeah. meeting up again and having yeah, a chat yeah, yeah. about how it used to be. And yeah, yeah. that happened. You must have known Jamie really well. Jamie was never, was he so? He would be another one that come into the Caribs here at um, category of having a lot of injuries. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, no, I, 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 and I, I then love taking, the that, taking that into the clinic. Um, obviously we've used our football connections to help promote the Lewin Clinic um, mm. which is not something that we are very comfortable doing because we don't sell ourselves very well um, but we were sort of overwhelmed by the, the response we had by a lot of people within football when we were opening the clinic um, one of the difficulties we've had with that is to let people know that we're not just a football clinic that deals just with footballers yeah but we are open to yeah. range of sports yeah. mm. musculoskeletal injuries. I actually wanted to ask both of you actually that um, there, is there a particular sport that either of you pay close attention to? Maybe it's just for a passion or that they, they do things differently that you like or Well, I was very lucky. I, Colin, I let Colin go into what he did because he went out to America a few times, but I was very lucky that when I went to the FA, <clears> I spent a lot of time with the ECB. Mm. Uh, um, ben Langley was a physio there. Um, when I, and I spent some time with him at Loughborough. Right. And I went into um, um, the rugby guys with Phil Pask, and I actually went out to a Lions tour when Gary O'Driscoll was mm. the doctor out in South Africa. And I also went into the Royal Ballet. So when I went to the FA, I managed to go into a lot more sports because when I worked at Arsenal, because there wasn't that many staff, you, you didn't really travel around to see what other people sure. were doing. Mm. When Colin <coughs> moved into Arsenal, they developed a massive research and development um, part of the club and uh, Count Colin did a lot of work going abroad to see what other sports were doing. I'll yeah, let I, think, uh, I think it would be stupid to think football does everything well. I think mm. certain aspects of physiotherapy, recovery and everything else that other sports do better, of course some do worse. So a few times, four different occasions actually, we went out to cities in the US. Um, everyone was very accommodating. We went to ice hockey basketball, NFL, um, mm. baseball, um, certain centres like Exos and Michael Johnson's Performance Centre in Dallas. Oh, wow. We, we must have visited 26, 30 different centres mm. just to see what we went to Harvard University to see what their sports medicine team were doing. Mm. And wow. You pick up one little thing from each place. Yeah, yeah. And don't get me wrong, a lot of the NFL stuff was a bit behind what we expected. Some of the NBA was in front. But it was very individual around the different franchises about what was good, what was bad. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah, only three or four days during an international break, get out there, see mm. us, go around every sport, come home. Yeah, add we some strings lucky. to your bow, yeah. Yeah, we were lucky that everyone let us in. Everyone was very open mm. and we reciprocated on a couple of occasions over here. But, mm. yeah, what particular sports... Yeah, I enjoyed what the NBA teams were doing and yeah, I was a bit surprised at NFL and baseball. Oh, our lights are gone again. NFL and baseball. There's our five minute warning there. <laughs> what's, it, what's it about the NBA, Colin? What, what, what was it particularly? The numbers. They're, they're very lucky that they've got 15 players and only 15 players. Right. No, team, no academy as such mm. on site. Mm. 15 players to keep fit. Yeah. For a game, well, lots of games, but mm -hmm. players and an awful lot of staff. So the player to therapist ratio was mm. brilliant, very low. Yeah, yeah. I think that allowed. Uh, but they also knew if they lost their big hitters, that's their season finished. Mm. Oh, completely. Course, you, you still yeah. see that in the NBA now, don't you? Like, you yeah. know, a couple of plays yeah. out, that's their season. Yeah, they would never say that out loud. They would never say out of the 15 mm. players that were there, they knew that those five had to stay fit throughout the season to give them a good shot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you look at Golden State, Golden State have dominated the NBA for the last four or five years. And then this year, obviously, Kevin Durant moved on, but you had Curry and, you know, and Clay out for the whole season and they're nowhere, you know, so, so just two players out. Obviously, I mean, any, any sport, any football team would miss their two best players, but nonetheless, it's mm. just, it's, it's obliterated, isn't it? 
Yeah, yeah we, we, we were lucky in Boston. We went to see the New England Patriots. We were spending time at Boston Celtics, and they lost one of their best players in game one a couple of years ago. Mm. You know, you just can't. Um, off, can you? We've got we've got a squeeze in our counter attack challenge. Both of you, we've got some quick fire questions for you. Um, so one each. <laughs> Uh, well, I think I know you can both answer each one. Yeah, just yeah. You might have different. You might have different competing so responses. The f- first question is: the greatest possible career lost to an injury. Oh, what a question that is to start! <laughs> wow. Um, We've got a word count, guys. They get easier. They get easier. <laughs> greatest possible career lost to an injury. Well, it can be a personal. It can be a personal reflection as opposed to trying to definitively find the number one career that was lost to to injuries. I mean, I never worked with him, obviously, because it was way back. But Marco Van Basten retiring at 27 was a terrible thing. Mm-hmm. God, good answer, yeah. I use that one. Gary? To an injury. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm really struggling. Um, you want to say well, the obvious ones for us to be Arsenal players. I mean, Abu, Abu would come mm. in because we all thought he was going to be a world class player. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so the, the problem with that question is, are you talking about a young player that nobody knows, but you thought could be a world-class player? Either or, or. Either or. That got injured and didn't fulfil <laughs> it. So, Gaz is cruciate. Yeah. Gaz is cruciate, yeah. Um, and then he broke his leg when he went to Lazio. Mm. Uh, um, I, uh, I mean, I didn't start, start working with him afterwards. So, um, um, Great question. Um, right, we're going Gaza, Van Basten and Abu then. Unless you're throwing someone else in the mix. No, yeah, I don't want to name Jack. Not Paul. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You've got a career. He's doing very well, yeah. yeah. Next up, so question two. Greatest manager that you've worked with? Well, mine's a bit obvious because I've not worked <laughs> with him very many. So can I claim Arson? Yeah, I'll claim yeah, Or a bad one. Yeah, I've worked with... We worked out the other day. I've worked with 14 managers. Wow. And I will cut mine down to two. Arson being one. Um, and Glenn Hoddle. Okay. He's... Nice. He took me into the England camp for the first time, and he was mm. very, very similar to Arsenal. Mm. Oh, okay. But he was great. In the player. Monaco link, yeah. 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 Question three is greatest player that you've worked with? You've got England as well, so I've got to go first. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> the obvious answer is Dennis Bergkamp. Um, always. <laughs> I always thought Robert Perez was. Yes, yes. He's an amazing player. Rob it's Andrew's Rob. favourite player. You see Perez there, is right? my favourite player. <laughs> I'll probably have to say Perez as the best player. Can I have Dennis Bergkamp as the best footballer? <laughs> is that allowed? <laughs> well, lucky we didn't go for a, a Henri or Bergkamp question, but then what about yourself, Colin? Gary. Okay. I'm saying Perez and Bergkamp. Gary? So I am going to say um, on the similar lines, um, I would say Dennis slightly over Thierry. Okay. Uh, from an Arsenal perspective. That's a podcast for another day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a whole, that's a whole podcast, isn't it? From an England, from an England point of view, um, Gaza was one that he was one of those incredible world class players. Mm. Um, I had the pleasure to work with for a, a few years, so yeah. I would say Gaza. Okay. This is a this is what gets even harder. Sorry, guys. If you could change one game. And the result, which one would it be that you've been involved in? Arsenal hat, Barcelona, Champions League final. Mm, yeah, don't we all? Yeah. England hat, Brazil quarter final World Cup. We were fantastic. We were fantastic. Yeah, 2002, yeah. They were the best two teams in that tournament. Yeah. Quarter final. Yeah. Uh, we, they were down to 10 men and uh, we could have yeah, won. Yeah, yeah. That is a good question. I was involved in eight FA Cup finals and only lost one. When Michael Owen sneaked two in the last eight minutes, somehow, contra <laughs> handball, contra handball. How does that, you know, we react? We have only one hand, so it doesn't count. Yeah, we, we were, talk about that handball now, don't we, Tom? <laughs> but the thing, the thing, the thing, what I would say about that. Sorry, I know that's a massive digress. Is that although I think we we were robbed there, we kind of nicked the 2005 against United, didn't we? Yeah. But, sorry, back to back to, back to the counter attack. <laughs> so, um, so, I think leads away at the end of the 99. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. We lost one nil. Yeah. Man, Man United won a treble. That treble would never have. Happened. We were so close to the double that year. My my biggest gripe is that season. We were we were so close to the double. If you think of Burkamp's pen in the semi final against United in the FA Cup, yeah. and and Leeds away, and, so, and Leeds away, Nigel had his 
nose smashed. So Nigel Winterman bits, had his nose and smashed. And went on at left back. Vives went on at left back and was arguably at fault for the goal. And Cabo de Oara, there's a name, hit the post from about five yards before. Oh, yeah, de Oara, yeah. And, uh, I remember that Vives being beaten at the back post. We win that game at Ellen Road. I don't think Man United would. No, yeah. Mm. That would be the one for me. Actually, I, 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 look, I, look, I look back at that. I look back at that. Um, the Birmingham game as well, the Eduardo injury. We're going way off track here, but the Eduardo injury at Birmingham. I think if we'd have won that game and held on, I think we would have won the league that year. But anyway, 2008. Um, if some last one, pots and pans. Um, the last one is dream dinner guests, dead or alive. You've got two each. Gonna, is there a pause button on your podcast? <laughs> we, we can, if you think in <laughs> silence, we can edit it out. <laughs> like, yeah, get an edit. Sport related. Okay. Well, two each. Right. The first one I'm going to go for, I've been lucky enough to meet him on several occasions, would be Pele. Okay, nice. Um, and I would love to have dinner with Jack Nicholson. Although okay. I don't play golf. And I'm Jack Nicholas. Golf. Nicholas. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> not the actor, the golfer. I don't play golf. I don't um, think Nicholson's uh, played anything. I don't, no, know. No. Um, uh, I don't play golf, but... Just That's not a bad two. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah, him him or Tiger Woods, I suppose. But yeah, I'd go for Jack. Colin? Oh, yeah, right. I've had all this time to think. Um, <sighs> I don't think he'd be a great dinner guest, but I'd love to sit and chat with Maradona and find out. That'd be a good party, party after, after dinner, though. Yeah, I think yeah, about the, um, not with us when he. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've yeah, met him briefly, yeah. but yeah, it, the documentary is a crazy documentary. I don't mm. know if you've seen it, but that looks like a one mad individual who probably spice up the dinner time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And no, I'm really struggling. The obvious thing would be football. Do you take the easy route and go Bobby Moore? It's a tricky one. Fantastic. Was l- I was lucky enough to be the physio for the Premier League team that did the Bobby Moore Test m- Memorial game at Upton oh, Park. Wow. Yeah. Graham was the manager. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I'm disappointed with that answer, but that's what I'm going to say. I'm, so we, I'm upset. So we're going with, we're going with Bobby Moore. Just, you can't be upset with Bobby Moore. Maradona, Pele, yeah. and Jack Nicholas. Only one tapped him we've ever had. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And again, I'd be it'd be a great party after, wouldn't it? Bobby Moore. Yeah, it would be. Yeah. <laughs> I think the I think Diego will keep it going until late in the morning. Yeah. 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 Be a late night. Uh, yeah. Um gentlemen, that's been phenomenal. Thanks uh, a really, lot, guys. Really enjoyed that chat. Uh, sorry to keep you so late. Appreciate you at, at work and you at Phoenix. So hopefully you, you're home soon. So yeah, safe yeah. journey home. Nice to talk to you both. Take care. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Once again, thanks to Gary and Colin for that fantastic insight into the world of medical work in football. We wish them both well on their journey at the Lewin Clinic. You can follow us at HTO Football on Twitter, that's at HTO Football, and on Facebook, that's HTO Football there as well. Thanks for listening, guys.